Imagine you decided to take a road trip the old-fashioned way. And by that, I mean you decide to do it without the help of any technology. What? So you go to the nearest convenience store and buy a map of each state you plan to pass through. You buckle them up on the passenger seat right next to you and set off on your adventure. During your first week, you arrive in the state of New York. You wave bye-bye to Lady Liberty, eat a slice of pizza, and head upstate. Near the Catskills, you notice you're running low on gas and decide to stop in the nearest town to fill up your tank. You check your map, and it appears that the nearest place is a small village called Aglo, right at the next intersection. You drive a few minutes and pass through a sign that says, Welcome to Aglo, home of the Aglo General Store. Well, this must be it, you think to yourself. But the town is strangely empty. You can't find the store or the gas station you were looking for. There are no houses. You start to think there might be a mistake. Aglo doesn't seem to exist. This story may sound made up, but it could have actually happened to anyone passing through New York a few years ago. Actually, the so-called town of Aglo is what is called a phantom settlement or a paper town. There are several of these around the world, but Aglo is probably the most famous. Paper towns are basically fake towns. That is, they don't really exist. They're made up of Easter eggs put there by map makers as a kind of copyright trap. Maps are tough to make. To create a map from scratch, one has to do years of field work or analysis of satellite photos. That's why plagiarism has always been rampant among map makers. It's pretty easy to redraw the same geographical features from one map onto a new map, and it is hard to get caught. People are, after all, drawing the exact same world. That's why map makers came up with a way to catch individuals stealing their data. Some map makers may include a mountain that is bigger than they are in reality. Others might add a slight turn on a road, where in reality there is none. For example, in the early 1970s, a fake mountain peak appeared on some Boulder County maps. The addition of this previously unknown peak, called Mount Richard, into local maps began to confuse Colorado rock climbers at the time. It turned out that Mount Richard was one of these copyright traps, put there by a local maps man called (laughs) Richard Siachi. Let's just say he must have decided to pay a tribute to himself with this little addition. Now, adding a paper town is perhaps one of the most extreme solutions, one that map makers hope goes unnoticed. But that's not what usually happens, which leads us back to the Aglo story. Map makers Ernest Alperts and Otto Lindbergh from the CDG, General Drafting Corporation, were part of the largest map publishers of the 1930s. Back then, the company was commissioned to create a map of the state of New York. That's when the two men had an idea. In order to prevent copyright infringement, they would create a phantom settlement combining parts of their names together. They came up with the strange name Aglo and added the fake town along Route 206 near the water reservoir of Catskills in upstate New York. The area was supposed to be, in reality, a dirt road. Years later, Rand McNally, another map designing company, produced a map of New York that included a town called Aglo in the same location where CDG had originally placed it. Lindbergh was convinced that he had a copyright case against his competitor, but the story just kept getting more complicated. Both companies went to settle the case in court. But as it turned out, McNally had a legitimate reason for adding Aglo to their version of a New York map. You see, in order to fabricate their maps, McNally did a thorough research on real estate and establishments located in each existing town. And as it turned out, Aglo was not an empty town when they drew their map. Records show that the town housed an establishment named Aglo General Store. Sure, it was the only building in town, but that was enough for the mapmakers to believe that such a town really existed. They added Aglo to the map like they would add any other town with physical establishments. It seemed they weren't infringing any copyright if this once phantom settlement had somehow come to life. The plot twist is that CDG's Alpers and Lindbergh could never have foreseen that someone would decide to occupy a made-up town. But it happened. One day, someone bought a map from a regional gas station that had Aglo marked on it. The person wanted to open a store more or less where Aglo existed, so they decided to name the store after the town it was in. 
They trusted the accuracy of the map they bought and named their business Aglo General Store. After all, why would there be a non-existent town on an official map? The general store didn't last many years, only enough to turn this story into a mess. On the bright side, <laughs> this whole debacle turned Aglo into a super-famous fictitious settlement. It became a tourist spot, with people driving from all over the US to get a picture of the town's welcome sign. Now, as we said before, paper towns are plenty around the world and over time, too. A 2005 BBC documentary revealed that the city of London alone had over 100 tiny fake streets or paper streets around the city. For instance, the so-called Moat Lane is supposedly a curving road in Finchley, North London. But if you ever decide to go visit, you'll find nothing but trees and gardens. And what about Argleton? a town in the north of England, or, more accurately, an empty field in northeastern England. Argleton existed for a while on Google Maps. There were hotel listings and apartments for rent in town. Well, the only thing is that they weren't really in Argleton, but rather in nearby settlements. It's believed that Google Maps imported these fake streets into its database as they used renowned copyrighted atlases as their sources. But as the truth about these paper streets surfaced, the company later deleted them. If we turn back the clock a few hundred years, we'll find another mystery story involving a possible phantom settlement. But this isn't a tiny town at an intersection, but rather an entire island. Bermejo Island was speculated to be a tiny inhabited island. It appeared on many maps of the 16th and 17th centuries and was a hot spot for Spanish explorers. Its location sometimes varied slightly from map to map, and occasionally, its name appeared as Vermija, but its existence seemed certain enough. It wasn't until the 18th century that the island stopped being depicted in maps altogether. This island's last appearance dates back to a 1921 edition of a Mexican atlas, and then poof! It dropped out of the horizon altogether. The case of Mexico's disappeared island has raised many questions. Did it sink? Was it destroyed? Are people simply looking for it in the wrong place? Three official investigations took place in 2009 to locate the island. They used high-end technologies, scouring Mexico's oceans and seabeds. Yet, Bermija remained nowhere to be found. One can't help but wonder if the island ever existed at all. Similar to modern-day mapmakers, 16th and 17th century mapmakers had their way to trick map users. Instead of copyright traps, these fake towns or even fake islands served as a way to fool and confuse enemies and unwanted voyagers. Since a long time has gone by, it's hard to know whether Bermija was just another phantom settlement. It stopped being depicted on maps, but this mysterious case still leaves people baffled and confused. It was April 10, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping-pong balls to make it float. 
while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay, off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tula, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, 
Someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875 using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen Mariana of Austria. Have you ever wondered how cool buildings of the future are going to look? Well, hold on tight because artificial intelligence is here to revolutionize the world of architecture. AI is a great sidekick. It can give the architects incredible new tools to create mind-blowing structures that are not only stunning, but also eco-friendly and super efficient. So let's check what our beautiful future might look like. First of all, you know how cities can get crazy busy and overwhelming, right? Well, guess what? AI is here to save the day and make our cities super smart. Imagine you're cruising down the road in your flying car. Yes, we'll have those. Thanks to AI, the traffic flows like a dream. No more endless gridlock. The city knows where the most likely crime spots are and takes proactive steps to keep us safe. It's like having superheroes on every corner. And hey, forget about trash piling up. AI makes sure waste is managed efficiently, keeping our city clean and fresh. They can act as a city manager who can optimize everything from traffic to safety and even waste disposal. They can analyze tons of data from all sorts of places like sensors and social media. With all that information, they can help city planners make brilliant decisions that make our lives better. Okay, so you stroll down the street and your eyes are instantly captivated by an extraordinary building. Its futuristic curves and features make it stand out from the rest. And it not only catches your eye, but also gives Mother Nature a high five. You might think it was designed by a genius architect, but little do you know it was actually a collaboration between humans and artificial intelligence. Imagine having a super smart design buddy who can whip up thousands of incredible building ideas in a blink of an eye. That's what AI-assisted design software does for architects. It can generate and assess a ton of design options. They take into account stuff like the best materials to use and the perfect placement for the building. Also, by analyzing data and crunching numbers, algorithms can help optimize the building's design. They can ensure it minimizes energy usage, conserves water, and manages waste like a pro. Every building strives to reduce costs, save energy, and promote a better world. The result? Architectural masterpieces that are both jaw-droppingly beautiful and super practical. The cityscape of the future will be dotted with these awe-inspiring structures. Oh, but that wasn't impressive enough for you? Well, how about a stunning, futuristic building that seems to defy gravity? It's not made of traditional bricks and mortar, oh no! This marvel was created using the powers of 3D printing. With the help of AI, architects designed every intricate detail and fed all the important data, like what materials to use and how the site conditions might affect the structure. AI algorithms work their magic to optimize the design, making it both breathtakingly beautiful and rock solid. 3D printing is basically like having a magical machine that can create awesome structures straight out of a sci-fi movie, and AI jumps in to make sure these structures are not just pretty, but also strong. In the city of the future, 3D printing will become the ultimate architect's tool. It will allow them to create structures that were once impossible to build. From mind-bending shapes to intricate details, the possibilities are endless. But AI isn't just making buildings look great. 
It also makes them efficient and cozy. Let's say you step into a futuristic office building, and voila! The lights automatically adjust to match your mood, and the temperature is set perfectly for you. These futuristic buildings are capable of sensing and responding to their surroundings, just like you do. They control the lighting, keeping it just right for the time of day. They manage the temperature, so it's always cozy and comfortable. They even keep a watchful eye on security and fix small issues before they become big headaches. So, the smart building knows when people come and go, so it optimizes energy usage accordingly, saving the planet and some cash along the way. Now the cool thing is, all these aren't the only possibilities. How about turning skyscrapers into a vertical forest? Recently, an architect from India got super excited about the power of artificial intelligence. So, he decided to team up with an image bot called Midjourney to create a vision for the future. But instead of a dull, robotic world, they aimed for something spectacular. With text prompts like utopian technology and futuristic towers, the architect and AI got to work. Guess what? Midjourney didn't disappoint. It conjured up a world where buildings were covered in lush vertical forests and adorned with shapes inspired by nature. They wanted to create a sustainable future that harmonized with the environment. The architect, Manas Bhatia, is super positive about AI's potential. He doesn't see it as a threat to his job, but as a powerful tool for positive change. He envisions a future where architects and AI collaborate to make breathtaking designs. In his project, Patya even asked the AI to imagine symbiotic and hollowed structures, and it responded with pictures of apartments nestled within hollowed-out trees. Imagine a world where the building itself becomes a living, breathing part of nature. Well, Bhatia believes that nature should play a big role in architecture. He loves designing structures that embrace nature's beauty and functionality. From buildings built around trees to facades that regulate temperature, he's all about blending architecture with the natural world. With architects like Patia and the superpowers of AI, the future of cities is going to be amazing. So get ready to step into a world where nature and technology coexist in perfect harmony. It's a dream we can't wait to see come true. Or if you're not a big fan of trees, how about this? Skyscrapers that aren't made of solid bricks, but instead, they're inflatable wonders. Zumo, an architectural practice in Barcelona, used the magic of AI to bring these wobbly structures to life. These inflatable superstructures rise above future cities like illuminated balloons in the sky. Here's the best part. These inflatable buildings have sustainability superpowers. You can pump them up to towering heights, flatten them for easy transportation, and rebuild them wherever they're needed. Plus, they're powered by renewable energy, reducing their impact on the environment. Pretty cool, right? Phew, the future is zooming toward us like a rocket. Artificial intelligence can become the secret sauce that makes architects work extra special. But hey, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to use AI wisely and ethically. For now, we don't have to worry about machines replacing architects. Artificial intelligence still needs a human hand, or else we might end up with buildings that look like mashed up bananas or ice cream cones, unless that's your thing. In addition, humans have one important advantage. They, well, are humans. We need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence doesn't have emotional intelligence. It's a brainy genius, but it can't fully understand the feelings and vibes we humans crave in our spaces. So, we must remember to infuse our designs with that human touch, those warm and fuzzy elements that make us go, Ah, oh, I feel right at home. And let's not forget that AI is still learning. It's basically just taking its first steps, and we need to be patient and give it time to grow. Rushing things too quickly could lead to wonky designs or buildings that look like a jumbled puzzle. This might look cool if you like avant-garde architecture, but for regular folk, no thanks. So, as the future unfolds at warp speed, let's embrace the wonders of AI and architecture. But let's also remember to balance its brilliance with our own human touch. Together, we can create a future where buildings are not just functional, but also filled with heart and soul. It's an adventure that's out of this